Good morning. Uh, just a reminder, if you're a visitor with us today or uh, it's your first time here, um, communion is open to all believers, so just partake in that with us as we take communion this morning. I'm going to read uh, out of John 18 a couple verses. Um, this is just a quick snippet of a conversation between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. So John 18, verses 36 through 37. Jesus said, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? That was the very next question that Pontius Pilate asked Jesus. What is truth? How many times a day do you ask yourself that same question? You know, what do I believe? Who do I believe? And where are we looking for truth? Are we looking into a political leader for truth? Are we turning on Fox News, CNN, social media, the science, trying to find the truth? What is truth? In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So each and every Sunday, when we come around the table here, that's what we think about. We think about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Jesus is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your son, Jesus. For without that truth, without Jesus... None of us have any hope, and we're so grateful for that. We thank you for each and every day. Lord, just uh, continue to be with us today and beyond, and remember that truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, and uh, welcome to Kimball Christian Church. I'm so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. If you're a guest here this morning, or uh, if this is your first time, a uh, special welcome to you, and um, we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. One of the ways that we like to connect is, is by just sending text messages or praying for you through the week, and so our staff has asked that you fill out a connection card. It gives us the opportunity to know a name and to begin praying for you, and um, if there's anything we can do for you, you're welcome to, to reach out to us. All our contact information will be online. Um, just a couple things for everybody to, to know about. Easter is coming. Uh, we're just a couple weeks away from that, and I hope that you're excited about celebrating Easter. Uh, we certainly are, and we're gearing up for just a fantastic weekend. And so just a couple things to let you know about. Um, one is that we've created just an invitation card. Uh, it's like the size of a business card. On your way out today, uh, we'll pass some of those out, and it's something simple that you can stick into your pocket and as you are rubbing shoulders with those around you, it, it would be a real easy way just to grab it and invite somebody to Easter services um, over that weekend. And so it's uh, quick for you to keep in your pocket, quick for them to shove in their pocket. So uh, make sure you grab one or two of those on your way out this morning. Uh, also, thinking about Easter weekend, we are anticipating that we're going to have a full house. Uh, we already fill the house quite often. Um, and, on a weekend and so we're going to ask you guys to even move further forward you guys did pretty good today this side is like excellent and this side yeah come on <laughs> um but during the easter weekend we certainly are going to have a lot more people uh coming up over the two services that we're having and so we'll ask you to move forward we'll ask you to squeeze together we'll have the lobby filled and so uh, just kind of know that's coming uh, one of the other things that that causes for us is that we don't have a whole lot of extra parking lot space. In fact, with all of the snow that we still have around and probably will still have in a couple weeks, we don't have the grass space to use. 
And so as a family, if you guys normally take a multiple cars to, to come to church, um, over that Easter weekend during a service, if you guys can carpool together, that would be awesome. It would help us with our parking and be able to get uh, even more people in. So just a couple of things to consider as we look forward to Easter in a couple of weeks. So uh, this morning, Robert's going to continue to bring the message to us, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Robert has to say. And I pray that uh, this is something that you hear, but you're put, put into your life and helps you grow closer to Jesus and um, helps you understand what the next step in your faith is. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word and being able to uh, learn from it and grow from it. I pray that as we um, hear from Robert this morning that you would use him in a dynamic way to help us to uh, live out your word, that we would grow closer to Jesus, and, and because of that, we would um, also look for others around us who need to grow closer and uh, bring them along with us. God, you are so good to us, and it's through your son's name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. All right, you might have noticed it up here. How many of you had one of these when you were a kid? Good old Jack in the Box. All the memories. Okay, so there's two kinds of kids in this world. The one kind of kid, when that Jack pops out of the box, what do they do? Scream, cry, okay. And then there's the other kids... When Jack pops out of that box, you know, it's, it's surprising, it's unexpected, but that kid, the very first time, a smile comes on their face and they start to laugh. So there's two kinds of kids in this world. I don't know, how many of you were the, the ones that just terrified you to see that thing come out of that? <laughs> I, I was a little nervous about doing this this morning, you know, doing, doing that and maybe bringing back some shell shock or something, but uh, um, so when little Jack jumps out of that box. Some of you hated it, but the rest of us actually enjoyed that whole jack-in-the-box experience. You know, every time that little guy popped out, it brought a smile to my face, and it, and it just made me giggle. You know, you, you, I never got tired of the surprised joy that I experienced when Jack made his, his uh, appearance. So this morning, uh, we're going to be taking a look at a few of the surprising, astonishing benefits of following Jesus. And I've, I've been a, a follower of Jesus now for, I don't know, about 44 years. Yeah, but much like the, that little kid who was surprised uh, and smiled every time Jack popped out of the box, I'm still astonished and amazed at the love and the gifts of grace that God has shown to me through Christ Jesus. It's not so much that it's surprising that God is a loving God or a gracious God, but it's truly astonishing that he would show such love and grace to the likes of us. We who were once his enemies. It's, it's just not what you would expect. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 16. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 33 as we continue in our series uh, this morning, looking at the final instructions that Jesus gave to his followers just hours before he would lay down his life and be crucified. Well, let me take a, a brief moment here just to, to brag on God a little bit. Now, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't know about you. I believe that God works in many seen and unseen ways in our lives according to his purpose. Three months ago, Tom asked me to uh, preach this passage, and for several weeks now, I've had it in my head what I planned on doing, and a smile broke across my face last week as uh, Tom started to share the SOAP Bible study method that he shared with, uh, when we were looking at uh, John chapter 15. I smiled because... God had already put it on my heart to teach a little bit about an important Bible study principle called context. You know, it's, it's the context as we look at the context of our passage this morning. And neither Tom nor I knew what the other one was going to be preaching about, but God knew. And that's what I love about him. He does that kind of thing. 
So what God or what Tom shared last week was one of the many good Bible study me- methods. He, he shared the SOAP method, and if you weren't here or if you didn't have an opportunity, uh, it's all outlined for you. It's back in in the uh, foyer at the Life at Home Center. You can uh, pick one of those up if you want. Um, and he was teaching us to uh, examine a passage of Scripture to help us really understand its meaning and its application for our lives. And we looked at the immediate context of John chapter 15. We looked at the verses that immediately preceded it and the, the verses that followed the passage and the words in the passage so that we could make sure that we clarified the meaning of the passage. Now, the primary purpose for considering context is to come to the correct meaning of a passage and the intent of the author when he wrote it. When we study a a particular verse or chapter in the Bible, we've got to remember that that verse is a part of a chapter, and that chapter is a part of of a book. But we, we can't stop there. Each book of the Bible does not stand alone. There is even a wider context that must be considered, and that's the Bible as a whole. The Bible is a, is a unique book. It's, it's, com- it's composed of 66 books uh, with, written by 40 different writers, written over a span of 1,500 years. But it's not a collection of individual books. What makes the Bible unique is that it is really just one story. It has one consistent storyline running all the way through the whole Bible that just one author, ultimately one author, God, is the author of. He inspired these 40 different writers to write what they did, but what they wrote was from God. The main story of the Bible, if you were to boil it down, the main story of the Bible is about what happened to God's kingdom. Now, you need three things for a kingdom, right? You need a king, you need a people, and you need a place. And the king in this instance, of course, is God. God is the king of his kingdom. He created the heavens and the earth to provide a place for his people that he made in his own image. But his people rebelled. Since the fall, human beings have refused to accept God's rightful place as king and have tried to dethrone him. But from the beginning of creation, before the beginning of creation, God had a plan to rescue men and women from this devastating results that our sinful defiance provided. This rescue plan was carried out by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In fact, God's love and plan to save people and restore his kingdom is is woven throughout the entire Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Jesus is the central character of God's rescue plan throughout the whole Bible. The whole book, the whole Bible is really about Jesus. The Old Testament predicts his coming and sets the stage for his entrance into the world. The New Testament describes his coming and his work to bring salvation to our sinful world and to reestablish God's rightful place of king of all creation. So if we want to understand any one part of the Bible properly, we must consider how it fits within the larger story of the Bible as a whole. If we just isolate a particular passage without giving due consideration to the the Bible's wider context, misunderstandings and misinterpretations may result. So we'll we'll come back to this concept of concept in in just a little bit when we get to verse 23. But uh, let's start with verse 16 of John 16. And take a look at the first astonishing benefit of following Jesus, a compassionate Savior. So starting with verse 16, reading through verse 20. In a little while, you will see me me no more. 
and then after a little while, you will see me. Some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. These poor guys... They were always so very slow to understand what Jesus was talking about. And of course, we have the benefit of hindsight, and we can clearly see what Jesus is referring to here, but it just wasn't sinking in for the apostles. At, and in spite of the fact that they had already been with Jesus for th three years up to this point, and not only that, just long, not long before the events of the chapter 16 here, Jesus had told him them on three separate occasions in plain language that he would be betrayed, that he would be crucified, and rise again in three days. Despite all of this, they just couldn't connect the dots. Have you ever gotten exasperated with somebody? I mean, so frustrated that uh, you just wanted to throw up your hands and walk away. Mm. Do we have any parents in here? <laughs> okay. All right, you're here. All right. I just, I just love how Jesus responds to the, the disciples here in verse 19. He didn't call them names. He didn't throw up his hands. He didn't roll his eyes. He didn't yell at them. He didn't give up on these guys. Instead, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about what he had been saying, and very compassionately and very graciously and patiently, he takes the initiative and addresses their need. Jesus, God in the flesh, demonstrates incredible patience, mercy, grace, and love, not only for these guys, but for all of his followers. It's what he has done time and time again throughout the whole story of the Bible and continues to do today. Psalm 103, one of my favorite psalms, says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a good father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And 2,000 years later, Jesus still treats his followers the same way. What a wonderful Savior. Did you happen to notice in verse 20 that Jesus didn't specifically answer their question? The disciples wanted to know when all these things that he had been talking about would take place. Jesus doesn't specifically tell them when. But the answer that he does give them is what they needed to know. You know, the hardest place to be sometimes is in God's waiting room. When you don't have all the answers and, and you wonder how it's all going to work out, trust Jesus. Trust him. He knows your need, and he will give you what you need when it's needed. All right. Let's take a look at the, the second astonishing benefit of following Jesus, an enduring joy. Let's pick it up in uh, verse 20, verses 20 to 22. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. 
A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one can take away your joy. Over the last uh, few weeks, we've studied these chapters on Jesus' final messages to his disciples. And we have seen again and again and again Jesus telling his disciples about some of the things that were soon going to happen. He was preparing them for a, a time when he would no longer be physically present with them. And he wanted them to know that when that time came, everything was going to be okay and that he's got a plan for how to take care of them when he's no longer physically with them. He was reminding them ahead of time to trust him even though they couldn't see him. Do any of you parents remember sending off your first child for their first day of school? You remember that? What did you do to, to help your child prepare for that first day? You know, a lot of parents, you, you know, you may have uh, taken your child to visit the, the school or the classroom or the teacher before that first day. Maybe you told them about all the different things that they'd be doing uh, at each point of the day. Uh, you practiced your letters or maybe you started reading a book uh, a couple months before school started. Maybe you talked about their feelings or their apprehensions and you tried to assure them. Well, that's the same kind of thing that Jesus had been doing for his disciples. He was preparing them for when he would be sending them off on their own for the first time. Now, if you were one of those parents that didn't do all of those things for your kids, don't feel bad. I was the youngest of seven children, and by the time it got to sending me off for my first day of school, all I remember is my mom looking at my older brother and said, make sure he gets there. <laughs> and that was it. What event in these verses, 20 to 22, what event is Jesus alluding to here? What is he talking about? He's talking about his death and his resurrection. He was referring to the fact that he would be crucified on a cross and three days later he would rise from the dead. On this side of the cross, this is a, a joyful re reality that we, we celebrate every day, but can you imagine what it was like for these disciples? They would soon see their beloved master arrested, falsely accused, sentenced to die, and finally killed on a cross. For those three days, the world rejoiced, but their hearts were broken. Their, their hopes that Jesus would be the Messiah that they were waiting for were dashed. Can you imagine the joy that these disciples felt on that resurrection morning when they first laid eyes on their resurrected Savior? It's hard to, to wrap your mind around the elation that they must have experienced when, when their grief was instantaneously turned to joy. I imagine it was a similar joy that we will one day experience when we finally see Jesus face to face for the very first time. You know, the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead changes everything. His triumph over sin and death has secured for those who trust him as their Savior a gloriously hopeful future that cannot be taken away. In Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul writes this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we certainly not, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Hallelujah. You can bet your sweet September on that one. That's an enduring joy. All right, let's move on to, to verse 23. Take a look at the third astonishing benefit of following Jesus, an amazing invitation. Reading uh, verses 23 to 28. In that day you will no longer ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name, Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Verse 23 is the very reason we spent a little time at the beginning of this sermon talking about context and the main story of the Bible. This verse is so often greatly misunderstood. Jesus is not saying here that if you end your prayer with, in Jesus' name, you know, say the magic words, then God is somehow obligated to give you what you want. It just doesn't sound right, does it? No, what does it mean then to do something in someone's name? Well, when you do something in someone else's name, it means that you are acting under their authority and acting on behalf of their priorities. If you wanted me to purchase a piece of property in your name, for example, you would first assign to me the authority to make the purchase, like you'd give me a power of an attorney, and then with that authority, I would be obligated to purchase the property that you directed me to purpose to, to purchase based on your priorities. I would not be acting in your name if I used the money you gave me to buy myself a, a Lamborghini instead because I wouldn't be using your authority with your priorities. What Jesus is telling us here is that he is granting his followers the privilege and the authority to go directly to the Father in prayer to ask him for things that align with Jesus' priorities. Praying in Jesus' name means the same thing as praying according to the will of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Praying, for, praying in Jesus' name is, is praying for things that will honor and glorify Jesus and will advance his priorities. And this is simply amazing. What a privilege that Jesus is inviting us to partner with him in his work in this world. In Christ Jesus, we have direct access to the Father through prayer because the Father himself loves us. And he invites us to come directly to him with our requests in Jesus' name. What an amazing privilege. What an amazing opportunity. All right, so it's fair to ask, okay, what is God's will then? What are Jesus' priorities? They're one and the same. 
When Jesus began his ministry, he laid it out very clearly. The message he began to preach was also the emphasis of his entire ministry. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. There's God's kingdom again. Jesus' whole mission was to, to restore God's kingdom by seeking and saving the lost, calling the rebellious sinner to willingly submit to Jesus' rightful place in our life as King of kings and Lord of lords by receiving the salvation that Christ alone would achieve for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. When Jesus taught us how to pray in what we now call the Lord's Prayer, he taught us what his priorities for us in prayer are. And as I'm going to invite you to recite the Lord's Prayer with me. And as we recite this together, I want you to notice what he places first. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now did you notice that Jesus didn't say that we shouldn't pray for the things that we need? He encouraged us to ask for our daily bread. But he taught us to make God's kingdom and God's will for our life our first priority in our prayers. God is, God is so powerful, and, and he wants us to, to remember that Jesus is asking us to, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And as we seek those things first, the basic necessities of life God has promised that he'll take care of for us. If we're going to pray in Jesus' name, by the authority that he has delegated to us with the priorities that align with God's kingdom and God's will, then that means we're going to have to get bigger and bolder with our prayers. God is so powerful, and he always accomplishes what he sets out to do. Therefore, let's start praying bigger and bolder for the sake of the lost. Bigger and bolder for opportunities to share the love of Christ with those who don't know him. Bigger and bolder for the opportunities and effectiveness in ministry that the Kimball Christian Church can be a part of. If you don't know where to start with bigger and bolder prayers, then I'd suggest simply start by praying this. Lord, I'm yours. Show me what you, how you want to use me today for your glory and grant me the power and wisdom to do it. In Jesus' name. And I think that's the kind of prayer that lines up with Jesus' priorities. So very briefly, let's just look at this last astonishing benefit of following Jesus, an unshakable hope. We'll pick it up with verse 32. But a time is coming, and has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave, you will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Once again, Jesus very graciously tells us ahead of time what to expect if we're going to follow him. Following Jesus comes at a cost. We looked at chapter 15 last week with Pastor Tom where Jesus warned us that the world would hate us because we love and follow him. So when persecution comes to you because of following Jesus, don't be surprised. Colin Smith writes, When you are opposed 
harassed, belittled, slandered, or, or even physically persecuted on account of your pursuit of a godly life, you do not need to ask, why is this happening to me? Suffering for being a Christian is normal, and we should expect it. This is the common experience of our brothers and sisters throughout the world, and all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Those who follow Christ will be blessed by God beyond measure and hated by the world. There just doesn't seem to be any exceptions. And he goes on to explain why this is. The roots of persecution lie in the hostility of the human heart toward God. When God's people are cold, confused, and compromised, reflecting little of their Father, the world will often ignore them. But, but when Christians get serious about pursuing righteousness, mercy, purity, peace, they will get under the skin of godless people and soon find themselves facing trouble. You know, so many people look for peace in the absence of trouble. But Jesus reminds us here that our peace is not found in the absence of trouble, but our peace is found in Him through what He has done to save us through His death and resurrection. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Paul reminds us of this. Remember that at one time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in God's kingdom and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Folks, salvation in Jesus Christ is a tremendously great, great treasure. The troubles we face on his behalf in this world are only for a moment and will be quickly forgotten when we are finally standing in the presence of Jesus receiving our long-awaited award, looking at him face to face. So when you face opposition or a harassment on the account of Jesus, remember what he tells you in verse 33. Take heart. In other words, take courage. Be brave. Be confident. Be undaunted. Hang tough. Be strong and courageous. Trust me, Jesus says. Trust Jesus as your Savior and your King, for he has already overcome any obstacles that could possibly prevent you from also overcoming the troubles in this world and arriving safely in heaven. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. For I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. What amazing and precious promises that God makes for those who put their trust in Jesus. Wonderful promises that I just never, never get tired of hearing. It always amazes me. Here's what I want you to remember today. Real and lasting joy Real and lasting peace can only be found in completely surrendering every part of your life to King Jesus and joining him in his mission to seek and save 
those who are lost. Let's pray. Oh, what a wonderfully compassionate and good Savior you are to us, Jesus. We thank you for your consideration of us, for telling us ahead of time that we would run into trouble, and providing ahead of time your Holy Spirit to be with us, your word to guide us, fellow believers to encourage us. You're so very good. We thank you for the amazing invitation that you have given us to join you in your work in this world, to call sinners, to proclaim the good news of salvation by repentance and faith in you. And I pray, Lord, that as you uh, work in our lives, that you would show us how you want to use us today for your glory and that you would give us the power and the wisdom to do it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.